SOS Potter, and now episode 2. Aftermath and a mystery in history solved. Day 2, June 30, 1996, 7.33 a.m. GMT. Harry woke up quite refreshed after a full night's sleep on his new sectional. Time to get the job done. He headed for the facilities and after having a unique experience with a sonic shower, dressed again in his environment suit and accoutrements and headed for the conference room. On his way he tapped his comm unit calling for Dobby. Dobby, are you up yet? Yes sir, Harry I'll meet you in the conference room right away sir. I have prepared breakfast for you. Fred and George have teleported up with some supplies and the Daily Prophet. Be warned, Captain. You're not going to like what that skeeter woman has to say this time, sir. Dobby looked over at Fred and George and cringed a bit and shrugged, then went back to his earlier modifying of the food dispensing units, while FMG also just shrugged and continued with their Dobby, made breakfast and reading the Daily Prophet while the conference room computer monitors were displaying local muggle events in the news. As Harry walked in the conference room, he looked at Fred and George and barked out, Report. Fred began with updating Harry on the status of Mooney and Lee accepting their new jobs, with little or no questions asked on their parts. Then George took over to report on the supplies acquired last evening and what was still left to do that morning. As Harry sat down to eat his breakfast, in front of him was the Daily Prophet with an oversized front page headline that read, He who must not be named, reduced to a squid. Is Potter the new you-know-who? Potter demands reforms, issues ultimatum. By Rita Skeeter, PR. Last evening the Minister of Magic, or Kingsley Shacklittle, the Daily Prophet, the Quiddler and the WWN, received a letter presumed to be from Harry Potter, proclaiming that he had removed the magic from and deposited it, he who must not be named, who Potter claims, whose real name is, Tom Marvolo Riddle, in a ministry holding cell, effectively neutralizing, you know who, as a present and future threat. Potter also claims, you know who created seven Horcruxes to ensure his immortality? Horcrux explanation. See page 7. Demands, from Harry Potter. See page 2. At first we simply couldn't believe that claim, but after receiving confirmation from the Ministry of Magic, it would seem that Potter has not only done the impossible but has also issued an ultimatum to us, the British magic community in general, stating in his own words, C-L-E-A-N-U-P-Y-O-U-R-A-C-T-O-R-E-L-S-E. It would seem that Harry Potter has somehow acquired the power or ability to remove the magic from individuals and claims he can do the same to the general population as a whole and has demonstrated this ability by doing so to you know who as its first victim. I can't help but wonder who might be Potter's next victim. Potter claims that Lucius Malfoy is a willing Death Eater with an obvious Dark Mark and claims that Dark Mark must be taken willingly. Will Mr. Malfoy be Potter's next squid and victim or perhaps that victim will be yours truly, Rita Skeeter, tenacious, intrepid, daily profit reporter the one that digs to find the truth and is never afraid to report that truth as I have in the past, pointing out for one example Mr. Potter's proclivity to attention seeking madness and wild exaggerations on past occasions. Is Potter the new you know who? Is Potter taking over for the now squid ex you know who? Will Potter carry out its threats to remove all the magic and place the beasts and other dark creatures in charge of us all, turning us into slaves to his new menace? This reporter believes we may have a new threat to deal with in the form of Harry Sheila. James Potter, the new you know who. Potter continues his claim that the lore result reduced a blood quill on students including Potter, with seeming approval from then, Minister Fudgeon attempting an unforgivable curse as well. If these claims are proven true, then indeed Miss Umbridge and Mr. Fudge should be investigated and prosecuted for this behavior. Harry Potter also claims that our justice system seems to work in reverse by prosecuting the innocent and releasing the guilty by way of blackmail and bribes. Potter has not offered a single piece of evidence to prove these outrageous claims of political and judicial corruption, but has suggested if we open our eyes and actually look for that proof, we will find it. If these outrageous claims are proven true, then perhaps Potter is correct to demand prosecution of these individuals including sweeping and widespread reforms to our system of government. Potter has also recommended, or was it demanded, that we remove the current Minister of Magic and in his place elect a barely 17-year-old muggle-born schoolgirl, Hermione Jean Granger, certainly with no magical government experience, to the prestigious and demanding post of running our magical government. This reporter has had past experience with Miss Granger and is quite concerned that if that ever came to be, Miss Granger would again use underhanded tactics to make her will obeyed. 
Would we want a muggle horn near squid injecting muggle politics and justice, upsetting our current system? This reporter has serious concerns about this particular recommendation, or was it a demand? The citizens of Magical Britain demand the Ministry of Magic take steps to contain this new menace in the form of Harry Potter. However, I personally can't help but wonder if that policy is pursued, will Potter actually follow through on its threat and either squid or outright muggle all of us? Do we believe he can do this? The evidence that he has done this to you know who seems clear. Despite what the citizens might actually demand, I for one would like to keep my magic. Perhaps we should bow down to this new threat, or at least investigate his claims. So far, Mr. Potter does not seem to have harmed anyone else yet, and has indeed removed the you-know-who threat that has terrorized and killed many innocent people over decades. However, do these threats and demands for reform seem oddly familiar to that of you-know-who, or perhaps a new you-know-who dark lord in the making? Anyone that has the power to remove magic from an individual or on a wholesale scale that Potter claims to have is certainly someone to be feared. The questions we must all ask ourselves now are, what do we do about his demands and threats and should we even investigate his outrageous claims? Until next issue, this is your tenacious, intrepid, daily profit reporter, Rita Skeeter. Harry sat there for a moment staring at the paper in utter disgust, wondering if he really should squid that witch bitch. Then he came to the conclusion it would just prove her point. On the other hand, he could publicly point out her illegal animagi status as the bug she is, and perhaps neutralize her pointy tentacles that way, at the same time, giving her some time to spend in a dark cell with Snake Boy Tommy for company. He couldn't help but wonder though, if the justice system would actually lock up the acid witch bitch for breaking the law or turn her loose like so many others. She no doubt has dirt on anyone who has any power and could likely blackmail her way out of trouble. While Harry was fuming a bit amusing what to do about, Acid Rita, Fred, George and Dobby were watching out of the corner of their eyes to see if their captain would blow a fuse. Much to everyone's surprise, Harry didn't get overly angry as he half expected this editorial from the Acid Queen bitch anyway. But, at the same time he realized that she was one of the biggest problems this magic community had in their midst and just knew he would have to deal with her in some way. It kept nagging at his subconscious that he didn't care anymore what these people said or did but knew that wasn't true as he did have some friends that lived in this backward system and didn't really want to split the right whole population of magical Britain. Right. He just wanted some reform and proper justice adjustments to their backwards ways. He would have to exit. give it a lot more right. thought and perhaps put his crew together in a think tank atmosphere to come up with a method of effectively altering this prehistoric backward system of political corruption. Then, as the Olumos had struck him in the eye, his first idea for dealing with Skeeter came to him. Perhaps he could convince her to study muggle democratic politics and their justice system for a few months. Although far from perfect, that system is a giant leap forward from the current magical system. Then ever report or perhaps write a book and introduce the concepts of that for the benefit of magical Britain? But, how would he convince her to do this? Threats of squibbing or turning her into a permanent muggle? Threatening to turn her into her bug form, permanently? Paying double her normal salary, effectively bribing the bitch? Blackmailing the bug in her? Go straight on. He would have to give it a bit more thought, he mused but felt he was on target with the right idea. That being, to make her an asset to both himself and the community, in general instead of the menace she has been. And she calls me a menace? He mused again. While all this was zipping around like a snitch on speed in Mary's head, the others were just watching his face change expressions with each new thought, but said nothing as they continued their breakfast, occasionally eyeing him discreetly, they thought. Then Mary looked up at the three of them realizing they were watching his reactions and Reconcent. suddenly yelled out. What? What the hell are you all staring at? When possible, make a Then a pregnant pause ensued. Oh, I get it, you're all waiting for me to blow us all up in a fit of rage, right? And he just watched as they all nodded their heads in unison, then added it. Oh relax guys, I'm trying to keep a loop on my anger and thanks to newfound brain functions, I believe I can think things through much better now without blowing up the planet in a fit of rage, but still, try not to piss me off, okay guys? He cracked a half smile while waving at the prophet and he continued it. We will have to do something to neutralize the Acid Queen which bitch though, she is almost as big a problem as old Snake Boy was. Fred entered the conversation rather reluctantly at this point saying, 
You're not planning on killing her, are you, Harm Captain? Oh, come on, guys. Do I really look like the killer type? Harry said with a questioning and somewhat agonizing expression, right. wondering if they really and thought he would do that, right. or were they afraid of him. George then casually asked, Turn right. What's your plan for her, Harry? It looked as though you had come up with some way to deal with the, what did you call her right, the Acid Queen Witch Ditch. And George looked from Fred to Dottie and back right. to Harry all nodding their heads in confirmation. Then with deliberate drama, Harry said, Well, I thought it might be the best idea to turn her into another pregnant pause ensued as Harry stretched out the drama a bit more while looking from one to the other an asset. And watched as all three of them let out a breath as though they were all expecting some great something else. Except for Dottie who was just playing along with Harry for dramatic effect, as he had been reading most of what Harry was thinking as he had some concern for his captain's sanity regarding that skier wish. Merlin, Harry do you have to scare us after death with your dramatics? Both Fred and George asked simultaneously. Then Fred continued with, Have you come up with a method to persuade the Acid Queen Witch Witch into becoming an asset? I have some ideas but nothing definite as yet. In fact, I'll give you two the job of thinking up the best way to convert her acid tongue to our way of thinking. I want some plan for that within a few hours. My first idea was to have her study muggle politics and justice and write a book for the magic community to incorporate. However, that was just my first thought. You two can go back planet side and complete the shopping. In fact, I may just join you to see what the atmosphere is like down there today. I will need to create an altered identity for myself as well. That reminds me, Dottie I want you to age your alter ego Neil, about 10 years and FMG you will need to create altered appearances as well, also to appear around 27 years old or thereabout. I want us all to appear as full adults so as to be taken seriously instead of treated like children by others. And don't slip up with that twin speak either, it would be a dead giveaway and need I say, don't create twin alters either, for the same reasons. Then we better familiarize each other with those new identities as well. You will also note that using the altered projection we can alter our voices as well. So we will get started on those new appearances first. Dottie, what more do you have to do in your reprogramming efforts? I have finished with most of the computer interface terminals, they all have a hand pad interface designed for my three fingered hands now, and I have slightly altered the original hand pads to conform better to human hands. I have about one more hour to complete the food dispensing systems and stasis chambers as well as to make a new interface for the food dispensers to display in English. We will have a variety of ways to order food as individual items, or about 20 varieties of complete meals. Fred and George can use the second crew quarters and alter it according to their needs in creative product development as well as our need for some potions like Veritasarum for example, as we don't actually have another way to force people to tell the truth. There will also eventually be a need for certain other potions as well, I expect. But that will be their department with your approval, sir. Excellent work, Commander. Very well done. I would like you to make the crew assignments as to what areas we each are best suited to be assigned to, including my ship's duties, but as a suggestion I will take on most data retrieval and conversion duties, final decision making on things that require captain's approval, general ship's pilot and operations, some inspection duties, but I expect all crew to be efficient in all of ship operations areas as to trade off duties and be far more versatile, since we have a very small ship's crew to begin with. On another note, I also want to float another option past you all and that is can we go back in time and prevent Sirius from falling into that damn veil and bring him on board. 1. I want him rescued if possible and 2. I think we could really use his skills once he has had some regeneration and brain upgrades, and just off the top of my head, I think we can do this without changing the timeline as well. It will appear to everyone else that he fell through the veil, even to him, but we rescue him a microsecond before he falls and bring him back to this future time. Dottie, you will be responsible for coming up with a plan and the calculations to pull that off. One more thing, Dottie, we need an interrogation and holding room, say about 2x2 meters, someplace we can teleport someone that we don't want to see any part of the ship. It will have to have scrambled or anti-apparition, anti-port key, in other words anti-escape systems in place, even though escape would be certain death, they would not know that as they would think they were on solid ground. It can be set up in your crew quarters or perhaps, in here or if you can think of a better place to put it and must be impenetrable, from outside sound as well, etc. 
the front or at least one of the walls, will need to be transparent, one way, from the outside looking in and some method of interrogating the occupant without that occupant, being able to see, hear or identify anyone or anything we don't want them to. In other words, we need a full interrogation and holding room, covering all the bases. Perhaps you can make it a two-room type setup with a communications terminal in one of the rooms for us and the other room for the interrogated person. Just my thoughts on that, I leave it up to you Dobby to come up with the best method and placing for this. See if you can get a handle on that while Fred, George and I are planet side today. I hope I'm not overworking you Dobby, do you think you can handle all that? Dobby managed to squeeze inches. No problem Harry, I should be able to have something put together by early this afternoon. It might take a bit longer to work out the problems, with rescuing Sirius though. Perhaps when you return later today, we can all go over that together and fine-tune the procedures? Harry nodded his acceptance and continued. We will certainly need this for Skeeter and possibly Sirius as well, as I am not convinced Sirius will be able to adjust to this or take orders from a 16-year-old, even if that 16-year-old is me, and possibly because it is me. He would see himself in a protective role, that being, taking care of me and may not be able to make the needed changes to that perception. If not, we will wipe that part of his memory and place him with Looney, give him a job at WWW after we clear him of his charges, then perhaps a bit later we can turn him also into a planet side asset. Either way I want him rescued, if at all possible. Who is best at memory charms, Dobby, Fred or George? As sure as Merlin at wrinkles, it's not me. Someone will have to become an expert at that, if not already. Well what do you all think? Harry let out the rest of an apparent deep breath as he managed to say all of that without blinking or seeming the need to take another breath. Fred spoke up finally, saying, Both George and I have also had to learn a variety of memory charming techniques, so one of us can handle that if the need arises. Very well, shall we proceed to create our altered appearance and personalities then? Harry asked. Three nods of the head and they began the alterations to the holographic projector units. Harry took on late twenties male, with light brown hair, hazel eyes, and square type face, with chiseled features with pronounced cheekbones and hollowed or sunken cheeks, with a masculine square chin and a slight five o'clock shadow. All in all giving him that hardened but commanding, tough guy look. He chose the name Hank Stone. The others followed Harry's lead much the same, in appearance all looking much like hardened but not overdeveloped fighters. Frank Clay, for Fred and Greg Slate, for George while Dobby chose a new name, for his new appearance, Danny fix it all keeping the first initials of their names to preserve, that part of the code names H, D, F and G, in an effort to be more like real government agents might look, also choosing dark or black pants and shirts, similar black, coats and at the computer's manufacture, curved but otherwise normal looking sunglasses, that were black from the outside but when wearing them, and from the inside looking out, they made everything brighter, clearer and more defined also having other features like night vision, microscopic and telescopic vision as well as a magnetic wave connection to the earpiece communicators, for amplified eavesdropping. These glasses also had microscopic visual sensors in the middle front that could transmit real-time video and audio back to the ship and to each other's glasses, allowing each other to see what the others were seeing by a sort of heads-up display horizontal along the top one-third of the inside of their lenses. The glasses had touch controls along the stems for fine-tuned adjustments and also drew their magnetic current power requirements from their suits and surrounding environment. One last thing was needed to complete the agent's look and authenticity, and that was identification that would fool all muggles and wizards alike. For that, it was chosen to use a department called SOS, GLOBAL99ULTRA, clearance levels, bearing authentic but recreated top-level international global security badges, which would assume it to be from some ultra-top secret international over-government issue of some sort. Although this part would be almost impossible for anyone to find, the SOS in this case also stands for Systems of World Security. Harry created this ID from the same ceramic fabric material the environment suits were manufactured from but reconstituted to look and feel something like a combination of a black dragon hide outside, basilisk hide inside, no seams or stitching, fused together folding type wallet, cover top outside branded into the black dragon hide look alike, is a Hungarian horn tail with full wind spread overlaid on Earth's globe with moon in the background and several star systems randomly placed. The Hungarian Horntail was chosen so the magic Keep communities right, in general would recognize right. that these were both Muggle and magic agents but Muggles would see something more closely resembling the American Eagle. 
Wallet size, close right. 12 centimeters, X 10 centimeters, X 1 12 centimeters. Top inside section, Get ready all text, to embossed right. into material. Picture here agent, Hank Stone. S O S G L O V A L 99 U L T R A 1 C L E A R A N C E. All units, to free your command, here. Signed, H. Stone, D. Fix it, S O S. Seal. Cosigned, F. Play, G. Slate, global seal. Six gold badges on bottom inside section. European, Russian, American, African, Asian, Islamic. Badges fused and sealed into lookalike basilisk skin. That cover bore the words, property of the SOS, embossed in a half moon, upward arc. Sorry no picture is available for this ultra classified document, somehow it has resisted all attempts to be photographed. It was determined that the more outrageous the ID, the more believable or the less questioned it would be. This identification would not likely be questioned even by the Queen or any president. This was such a high level, top secret clearance that even the issuer didn't question it for fear of 20 years imprisonment. In fact the issuer was none other than Harry Potter himself laughing his ass off as he created them. He also realized it would not be too difficult to input the necessary data into some government computer mainframes to have a form of authentication, if only to say that there is an SOSGLOVAL99ULTRA security department, but all files and information are ultra classified to this warning. Defer your command to ID holder. You are now being traced, your clearance levels do not allow further access, any disobedience or further attempts to view these files will result in imprisonment for not less than 20 years. Go straight on. Would be the only info or message one could get if anyone actually tried to check. This would effectively make Harry and crew completely legal and quite untouchable, not forgetting to mention wave of the law. This is why Harry was on the floor in front of the computers in out of control laughter while the others just watched him in amazement after he created four ID packets before they also caught on. At last, after finally getting a grip back on himself, H, F and G were ready to visit down below and complete the shopping and anything else they could think of while on walkabout and find out just what was happening and what people were saying in general about Tommy Boy squibbing and subsequent incarceration. But Harry was most interested in what the Ministry of Magic's reaction to his so-called ultimatum and the Skeeter editorial about said letter. Fred and George were going to go back as themselves but Harry opted to try out his new Hank Stone persona but decided to stay a bit in the background and just watch people and events from the background as F&G went about collecting the remaining shopping items and so on. Day 2, June 30, 1996, 10.21 AM GMT. Diagonally. H, F and G opted to teleport down in a muggle alley just outside the leaky cauldron and had altered their hologram to conceal the new sunglasses. Another feature of the holographic unit was that the hologram did have a substance to it meaning that you could touch the holographic projection and it would look and feel the way it was projecting. This was due to the dynamics of Never the magnetic mind. field matrix it was created route. from. Fred and George appeared just as Make they usually did, flaming red hair, route. freckles and twin speak in tow, while Harry watched and listened through his glasses Please in the background as they proceeded possible. into the leaky cauldron. The cauldron was packed with witches and wizards celebrating the Dark Lord's defeat. Snippets of conversation could be dissected as they passed through the cauldron on the way into Diagon Alley. Parts that were overheard went like this. Strip his magic, how could a mere boy, that Skeeter witch, is going to get herself old Rufus, must be Malfoy, death, blackmail and bribery, you say blood quill, she wouldn't work Rufus, what our work school girl recommended to be the next minister of umbrage sentimenters after pot fudge, may have approved those decrees were just, those were just some of the snippets, garnered as they passed through into Diagon Alley. Meanwhile at the ministry building, in the office of the minister of magic, Rufus Scrimgeour was not having a good day, to say the least. He was reading over that letter from Harry Potter again, and the Daily Prophet Skeeter editorial, and had taken to throwing a few things around while swearing at the situation he now found himself in. For old Rufus was one of the black left. people Potter had referred to. Turn left. He had to make the right choice here, and even if he did he could lose his job along with half the ministry. If he chose to go after Potter and arrest him, as Skeeter suggested, he could doom the whole community to squibbing or worse. He sent for Tinsley Shack Littleton, the head of the DMLE, Amelia Holmes, and still had not decided what he was going to do until he felt them out on this subject. As they walked into his office, he instructed them to sit and asked, Well, what do you two make of all of this and what do you suggest we do about it? 
Just a moment earlier, Dobby tapped his earpiece and called to H. F. G. telling them he had been probing the minister's office and then eavesdropping in on the minister's conversation with Chinsley and Amelia Bones and that they might want to hear what was transpiring right at that moment and then opened the channel for all three of them to hear. Rufus could then be heard by all, saying, Well, what do you two make of all of this and what do you suggest we do about it? Chinsley was the first to respond. Minister, I know Potter, he is nothing like Skeeter, would have us all believe. He is not an attention seeker, in the least. He hates his fame, with a passion. He is a straight up wizard, and if he says he's quit Keep volume right. gold, damn it, Voldemort. Then you better believe him. If he says he can do it to all of us, I for one believe him. My best advice is to get to work at cleaning up the bigotry and corruption that we both know is rampant in our society. Yes, it may mean some of us will lose our jobs and may even be arrested and sent to prison, but if we do it right we may have yet another chance to correct the problems and save some of us who have not been too badly corrupted. Minister, I know that you are, at heart, a righteous wizard. It is time now to do the right thing. Amelia then entered her comments by injecting. Minister, I concur entirely with Kinsley here. Potter has given us the opportunity to clean up this entire mess from the top down or the bottom up. If we take the proper steps and acknowledge your own failings first, then promise to do better, you may avoid prosecution as well as keep your job, sir. If you choose to follow that Skeeter Witch's suggestions and go after Potter, who I might add, just fixed our biggest headache in years, who is now sitting in a holding cell with little more magic than a squib, then I fear Potter will do just what he claims he can and render us all muggles or worse. I suggest we start by putting a leash on Skeeter, issue detainment, for questioning orders, for fudge and umbrage, issue arrest warrants, for Lucius Malfoy and Peter Pettigrew and start a sweep of all ministry employees that may have a dark mark or affiliation with you know who's Death Eaters. I recommend the use of Veritasarum for everyone, starting at the top. And as they say, the next move in this game is yours, choose wisely, sir. Rufus thought about how deeply was his own involvement and since he had only taken a few bribes, from time to time he could lightly risk the Veritasarum and then let out a long tiring sigh and then said. Very well then, start procedures on all of that and I'll schedule a press conference for 3 p.m. today. I need to address the people personally if we are to make things right. I want that Skeeter Witch in my office in less than 30 minutes, one way or another. It is time to get control over that witch, or shut her down, from this day forward they will only print the truth and only, with confirmed sources, for their published stories. There will be no more making, of the so-called facts or Skeeter style speculation and innuendos type of editorials. As for the Quiddler, well then Aphilius Lovegood has not Keep been a problem and mostly, and he just prints left. outlandish entertainment stories, so I think we can leave him alone, for now anyway, same with the WWN. The Daily Prophet is the turn real problem left. publisher here. Take whatever steps you both feel are necessary, I will back up any decisions you may have to make while in the field. He waved his hand at the door while saying, Dismissed. As he watched his two best people leave his office, the old lion look alike, put his head in his hands and said out loud to himself and basically, to the empty room. Potter, Go you sure have on. created a nice mess for me to clean up here. You could help us clean Keep it up right. instead of running off to, what was it? Ah yes, extreme traveling. And why is it, I wonder, that no magic use for you has shown up on our detection devices? Can someone explain how you can drain, you know who, of almost all of his magic, with no record of a spell, ritual or whatever you use it? Then old Rufus let out another sigh and rubbed his temples in an attempt to shake off his now throbbing, potter induced headache. Meanwhile that, in diagonally, H, F, and G were continuing on with the shopping while listening to the minister's diatribe about Harry Potter giving him such a headache and not knowing that Harry was actually listening in. Harry tapped his comm unit just to say that they may not actually have to convert the Acid Queen which bitch but they can wait a few days to see what will happen in that regard. Then reiterated that it would seem old Rufus may be making the right choices for change. They continued their shopping through Diagonelli, entering a bookstore just off the main circuit and partly into Nocturnelli. One which FMG seemed quite familiar with. Looking around while FMG picked up several obscure books on becoming Animagi, a few on potions and three on apparition. With these last books the book shopping part was mostly done. There was one thing Harry wanted to look into and directed them to go to a luggage shop to see what kind of trunks might be found, particularly trunks with hyper or subspace dimensions inside. 
meaning they were much larger inside than they looked from the outside. Harry had been thinking about old Moody's trunk and thought if he could find something like it, they could create more rooms and spaces on the ship if they would work in the magnetic gravity and general ship's atmosphere. They entered a store called Stanley Lex Luggage. Author puzzled by this seemingly familiar name, Harry stood back and watched as the twins asked questions and looked over some of the trunk models. They found one that was just right. Standard from the outside, a bit longer than a meter, about as as wide and a half meter deep. Go straight on. Inside was quite roomy having four separate compartments, entered by a slide in, and ladder out, each about five meters square. The one they were looking at was an empty model and Fred asked if they could leave a deposit and take the model one with them to see how it would fit in at home. Mr. Stanley Lux had no problem letting them have it for a few days and shrunk it down for them. They wanted to make sure it would work in the ship's environment before going back to purchase a few of them as they could be needed for a variety of reasons including extra ship's space. They took one more walk about diagonally, wandering up to Fortescue's ice cream parlor, sat and ordered three sundaes, all different flavors. As they sat there watching and listening to passers-by, Mooney happened by and spotted the twins, sitting with an unknown man at their table. He simply could not resist the temptation to come over and say hello to them. Hello there, what are you boys up to today? Mooney casually asked while looking over the strange man at their table. Then reached out his hand and said, Hello, I'm Rumus Lupin, nice to meet you. Harry reached out his own hand and shook Rumus' hand introducing himself as Hank Stone. Rumus noticed the strange accent of this man and asked, Keep Mr. Left. Stone, and then I don't back. recognize your accent, where would you be from then? Actually, I travel a lot and my accent often changes to blend in more with a native inhabitant of wherever I might happen to be visiting, it's Turn just a left. talent I acquired in my travels. But right now it seems to be a blend of British, Canadian and Dutch, I think. Hank reiterated nonchalantly and smiled disarmingly. Mooney smiled as he asked, And now did you meet up with these two delinquents? Get ready to turn Hey, up. is that any way to speak about your employers, my dear Mr. Mooney? Both F and G said half the sentence each. Mr. Turn Mooney, left. I thought you said your name was Remus Lupin? Hank asked. Oh, Mooney is a nickname given to me by friends a long time ago. Mooney said. Is that because of your condition, then? Hank asked. Mooney sat up straight a bit defensive and just muttered, how? Oh, fear not, Mr. Lupin. In my travels I have come across many so-called dark creatures, most of which are not even so-called dark. It's just a label power people like to tag on those they fear. As to how I know, well, I have very sensitive senses. I can smell the wolf in you. Hank answered. Go straight on. We must relax a bit at F&G. Talked about some new store policies and of looking for shop in Diagonale as well as the one they now had in Oxmed. Expansion had been on their minds for a couple of months and now it was more than possible to take advantage of that. They set Rumus on the task of looking for a proper store to lease or even buy outright. It would seem that Rumus was well on his way to earning his new position of general manager of WWW by hunting down new staff, full and part-time, to man the store or stores as needed and people he could call in at the last moment to take over for one or the other when needed. After a few minutes Rumus made his pleasure to have met you, goodbye speech and resumed his WWW diagonally searches. About five minutes later they were just about to leave, when several apparition pops could be heard and then several screams rang out as flashes of spell light could be seen in the distance. Must be bloody Death Eaters attacking. What do you want us to do, Hank? F screamed out. Quickly into the alley over there, and change into Frank and Greg, shields up full, use only wands. We haven't tested one from the inside of the shields yet, Hank. We may end up hexing ourselves, I suggest we spread out, diggers on stun. Fred said. Right, I forgot about that, very well, diggers on stun, let's take him down. Hank ordered. So, H, F and G, entered their first fight as agents of the SOSGLOVAL99ULTRA security. Spreading out, magnetic shields at full and began stunning the Death Eaters, which had no defense against the digger stun weapon. Since this digger weapon emitted a blue beam of light in the stun setting it blended right in with the multi-colored lights the wand spells produced. There were 15 Death Eaters in all and all had been stunned within the first five minutes, with no casualties other than a few repairable hexes on some of the bystanders. 
People were still running around screaming though, not having realized the fight was over. Then the orders arrived, arrogant as ever not having been given the word from the minister to alter their behavior and approach. Keep right. You there. One of them yelled at Hank. Drop your wand, face down on the ground, now. As Hank was turning around to face the Auror who had ordered him down, the Auror fired a spinner at Hank, which just bounced off the shield. As Hank approached the Auror he said, What the hell is the matter with you? I just did your job for you and you have the arrogance to try to arrest me. Hank then took out his Keep ID and shoved it in front of the arrogant Auror, right. saying, Unless you want to spend the next 20 years in a prison cell for attacking a government special agent, Turn I suggest right. you get your boss down here right now. Move it, mister. Or Dolish nearly messed his pants when he saw the ID card and badges and just stammered out. Why, why, yes, sir. Right away, sir. And popped away to return with Kingsley Shacklittle a few minutes later while the other Aurors were securing the Death Eaters. Or Dolish introduced Kingsley to Agent Stone of SOSGLOVAL 99 ULTRA security and then backed away for a bit of distance. Agent Hank Stone showed Kingsley his ID and answered his questions about Go the Death Eater up. attack. F and G were just standing to one side watching as Harry took complete control over the situation and the oars while learning from him how to take this control and hold it amongst a growing crowd and the officials that show up in the aftermath. At the same time at the Ministry of Magic, more Death Eaters were trying to break into the Ministry on. in an attempt to break out their Lord Voldemort from the level 9 holding cell and were met by another 20 oars and Ministry staff at one point. Spells were traded with the Death Eaters, then three Aurors and one staff member lost their lives to the kill and curse. Just at that moment the Minister's voice could be heard over the sonorous spell, giving permission to use the kill and curse in retaliation for the four Keep dead Ministry right, employees. And then turn right. It didn't take much longer to kill or subdue the 30 Death Eaters that were storming the Ministry. Several Aurors had right. been hit with life, threatening spells and were rushed to St. Mungo's hospital for much needed repairs, while the still alive Death Eaters were ushered into holding cells, searched on all objects and wands, confiscated and then given medical treatment to stabilize their conditions. Among the captured Death Eaters was none other than Peter Pettigrew who it seemed had just transformed into his rat persona in an attempt to escape but was spotted then stunned by Oren Fedora Tonks. Meanwhile back at Diagonelli, the mop-up continued as an Aura ran up to Kingsley telling him of the attempted breakout at the Ministry. Kingsley excused himself and apparated back to the Ministry. By the time he got back the whole thing was over. H, F and G had all they needed for the moment and decided to discreetly return to the ship. After arriving Harry said, Let us test those wands right now, to see if they will work within the shielding of the suits. Fred and George energized the shielding once again and threw a few curses at one another and much to everyone's surprise, they only ended up cursing and spelling themselves. Well, Harry said, we will have to do something about that. He deactivated the shielding and then innervated the twins and suggested a variety of magnetic displacement adjustments and modifications until they got the shielding to work with wands. It took a few well-placed spells and they were quite the rainbow shades of color and shapes before they got it right. This was much to Harry and Dobby's great amusement as they watched the two exchanging spells. After they had experimented and got the settings just right so they could fire spells out, but none would get in. All four of them made the same adjustments and tested the units again. Satisfied they could now use spells and wands within the magnetic shielding of the suits they all went back to the conference room to discuss the next mission that of the time travel back a year and the rest you of Sirius Black. The first thing was to pinpoint the exact date and the exact time they needed to be at. It was determined by way of pensive memory that the DOM fiasco took place on the 26th day of June 1995 at exactly 8.42 p.m. GMT. This was the exact time that Sirius was hit with a stunner from Bellatrix Lestrange and fell backwards into the veil. Keep right, so it was determined that they would have right. to be there at least one hour earlier to make sure or at least hope that nothing went wrong. New entry into Captain's personal turn lives. Right. Do not do list. Captains do not do order seven. Do not invoke Murphy's law. Harry sight. Dobby had come up with a method of this rescue, by way of a holographic double of the veil placed directly in front of it but in a way to obscure the real veil from sight and having placed a magnetic net over the real veil in an effort to prevent any accidents. They would set this up before any of the Ministry crew as they called themselves or the Death Eaters even entered the veil room, then they would Keep wait in an out-of-phase condition for the right moment and then teleport Sirius right into a stasis pod placed in the holding cell that Dobby had left. created in the far right corner of the conference room. 
About 45 minutes later, Doggy announced Ian Airy had finished the calculations for Re-roots. using a hyperspace jump, utilizing the sun's gravitational well, incorporating the dark matter, curved gravity between Earth and the sun would bring them to the right day and they should arrive back in orbit at approximately 4.30 p.m. on the 26th day of June, 1995, GMT, give or take one hour. Harry took his place in the bridge control chair as Doggy, Fred and George stood off to the sides of the computer console. Harry would be piloting the ship for this journey. All systems are go, Captain. Earth date and time is June 30, 1996, 1.18 p.m. GMT. Right, on one then, prepare for hyperspace time jump in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, execute. Just seconds into the jump as the ship had reached 1-1 one, one light speed and began the automatic acceleration phase around the sun, the ship was hit with a massive solar flare accompanied by a dark matter displacement, both hitting the ship seconds apart, causing a gravity distortion almost liquefying space-time, which sent the ship spiraling out of control towards Earth and knocking out several of the ship's systems including inertial dampeners and the artificial gravity, sending all four of them hurtling into the bulkhead walls and rendering them all unconscious for the duration of the journey. Fortunately, they were all wearing the environment suits, although their magnetic shields had not been turned on. The environment suits were the only thing that kept them all from being matter splatters on the bulkhead walls. June 14, 1917, 1.04 p.m. PT. British Columbia, Canada. Harry was the first to come back to awareness as he tried to look around he could see magnetic sparks dancing around the ship's circuitry and a few wall panels hanging loose with a triaminic and circle or newly renamed magnetic current ceramic fibers used for connecting the circuits hanging in the open holding the panels from dropping to the floor. They had crash landed that was certain. Harry made his way over to Doggy and the twins and then innervated all three of them. Fortunately all were alive and not overly damaged from the incident. What the hell happened? Harry, are you okay? George managed to gargle out. Harry said, The only thing I am sure of at this point is we have crash landed. I have no idea how long we have been out of it. They made their way down to the main deck avoiding hanging control panels and dancing magnetic discharges that seemed to arc across large distances within the ship. Then they saw it, a rather large, gaping tear in the outer hall between the tools and information center. Then Harry noticed a body lying on the floor in front of the information control computer. Dobby, can you start an assessment as to our damage and where we might be? Fred, George, you come with me and we will try to determine who our uninvited guest is. Harry rasped out. Approximately one hour earlier. In 1917 a 29-year-old Eddie had been working for various lumber camps in California, Texas and currently in Canada. Eddie had immigrated from Latvia a couple years after his planned wedding in 1914 was cancelled at the last minute by the right to be citing age differences for the reason. Eddie had spent a little more than a year moving from camp to camp where the work could be found. On this 14th day of June, 1917, Eddie was working this lumber camp in Canada's British Columbia forest just north of Merritt, B.C. When out of the blue as they say, he heard this screeching, humming and crashing sound as something fell out of the sky just a few hundred yards from his position. He hadn't seen it as it came down so fast while Eddie was with his back to the object wrapping a yellow ribbon cloth around a rather large tree, marking that tree for killing by the lumber camp he was currently working for. Naturally, and being the very curious sort of person that he was, he went to investigate the unusual sounds he had heard. As he approached the thing that fell from the sky he couldn't help but wonder what this was and where it had come from. He was looking at some sort of disc-shaped object, metal or something like it in nature and most importantly, it seemed to be a manufactured construct and not a natural object like a meteor that you might expect to fall from the sky in 1917. He walked around this object and found an opening, bludgeoned through the hull from colliding with a massive tree he suspected and ventured cautiously inside the thing. He looked all around himself then bending down to pick up something that caught his eye. It was small and disc shaped and had a ring protruding from it as though it was meant to be worn on the middle finger and the disc part placed in the palm of your hand. The ring, he thought, was big enough in diameter for him to place two fingers through it. As he picked it up he could feel a strange tingling sensation dance across his fingertips for a moment and then stop. He absentmindedly pocketed the object and for the time being just forgot about it. 
He ventured a bit further inside and saw the computer console ready, for the mapping and information right. room but had no idea what to make of it until he saw the newly configured four fingered and one thumb hand pads access to the computer turn console. Right. Magnetic sparks were dancing all over the ship's systems but Eddie did not seem frightened or overly concerned and then curiously places right hand on the hand pad. A momentary jolt of seeming lightning struck him and he was instantly out cold face up on the floor in front of the console. Harry bent down to look over the stranger that was in their midst and could not help the feeling that he looked familiar in some way as though he should know who he was. A rather slight man somewhere around 28 to 32 years old, Harry right. thought, thin and rather fragile looking by comparison to most others and at first glance, rather unsweeted physically, to be pounding about in the woods cutting down trees, Harry thought. Turn right. Well, shall we enervate this stranger and find out who he is? George asked. Enervate. Shouted Fred from the other side of the man. Groggily, the man sat upright and looked around at his audience and tried to splutter out. Who are you? Where am I? What is this thing? Then he took another look at his audience and they were all wearing some sort of greenish lobby suit and spluttered out again. What are you? Sighing, Harry said. If you don't mind, we will ask the questions and you will answer them, okay? The man just nodded his head in agreement, and then said. My name is Eddie, I work for the lumber company, contracted to remove some of the trees in this area. My job is mostly to scout out the right size and age of the trees to be cut down, and then mark those trees Keep for the left, cutters. And then Fred, turn left. Harry called out. Go outside and place notice me not, muggle repelling charms and anything else you can think of to keep us hidden. Turn left. Circle the entire area, we may be here for a while. A.A. Captain. Came the response from Fred as he made his way through the opening to the outside world. Then Harry asked Eddie. What is the date today, Eddie? Eddie looked at the green, suited man strangely and said. June 14th, sir. Harry had to sigh when he asked what the year was. The man, Eddie, looked even more perplexed by the fact that someone had not known what year it was but answered nonetheless. Why it is 1917, sir, June 14, 1917. He repeated. And where are we on the map? Harry asked. Um oh, this is the forest north of a small town called Merritt in British Columbia, Canada, sir. Okay, Keep Harry right. was satisfied and he had all the information right. he needed out of this oddly familiar man, but never once did it occur to him or anyone else to inquire of this man's last name. Turn right. It was as though that notion was prevented from entering their thoughts, like some cosmic force was preventing it. Harry asked George to escort Eddie out of the area and obliviate his recent memory of finding them. That part handled, Harry addressed Dobby, asking how bad the damage was. Dobby just on. looked at Harry in astonishment for a moment wondering what Harry was expecting him to say. Well, Harry, Captain, sir, we are sort of I'm big, dragon done, trouble, sir. Dobby exclaimed. We are in the year 1917, the ship has sustained major damage, we are in the middle of the bush, in the middle of nowhere, likely a very long distance in time, from the nearest repair shop, for ultra high tech UFOs. Sir. Dobby, with twisted sarcasm, factually informed his captain. Then Dobby let out the elf version of a sigh, took a deep breath and said. The good news is, with magic and the ship's self-repair functions actually working now, with a few minor repairs and a rebooting, the ship will go as far as it can to repair circuitry, for the most part then it will begin on structural reformation. We could be here a few days, or even a week, possibly longer. Well that's not so bad then, I can stand a week of smelling the forest, I think. Harry said with a relieved expression. We better pick up all the crash material from the ship that is scattered around the area. It will be needed for some repair work I suspect, and we can't leave any evidence that the ship was ever here. After four days with the ship and crew working mostly around the clock and little to report about or worthy of including here, most of the repairs had been made. The gaping hole in the side of the ship had slowly recombined and was now just about finished. The ship was now standing upright on its eight, spider-like, telescopic legs and Dobby had just reported ship functions at 99.7%. It was time to leave here and get back into Earth orbit and begin working on the next major problem of getting back to their proper time or continuing the original mission of rescuing Sirius. But they needed to know what had happened in the first place for them to wind up crashed in 1917. 
They couldn't, wouldn't dare try another time jump until they understood that. June 18, 1917, 10.42 a.m. PT. The four time travelers entered the bridge which had been altered during the repairs to accommodate four separate computer control consoles, three in front and one behind, facing forward, with one viewing wall in front and one to each side. The left and right control consoles were Fred and George's respectively and slightly angled toward the side viewing walls. Harry's station was like that of his remembered captain. Kirk's placement just behind the other three stations and elevated a few centimeters on a swivel. Harry could pilot and control all ship's functions from this new station while delegating more hands-on and monitoring tasks to F, D, and G. Prepare for liftoff and vertical acceleration to a 250,000 km standard stationary orbit. After standard orbit is attained with the ship in full stealth and out of phase condition. Harry ordered. AA, Captain. Dobby answered. The ship gracefully rose a few meters, then a few more meters as the landing legs collapsed back into themselves. Suddenly, the ship shot straight up and would have appeared to an outside viewer as though it had just blinked out of existence. Standard stationary orbit obtained, directly above Canada, Captain, activating full stealth magnetic shielding and optical curve, frequency shift alternators, now activating resonance hyperspace frequency generators, for ships 180 degree, subspace, out of phase condition. All ship systems now operating at 100% efficiency, switching to automatic stabilizing and operational controls, or as you may prefer, Captain, autopilot. Doggy rattled off. Excellent and I have two new, standard captain's orders. Number one, from now on before any space maneuvers are activated, all ship's personnel present will activate their utility belts full personal magnetic containment shielding. Secondly, and this seems very important, D-O-N-O-T invoke Murphy's Law. Dottie already knew what Harry meant by Murphy's Law, but the twins had never heard of this law and just looked from one to the other with word what poised on their lips. As they looked at Harry for an explanation, Harry just gave them that don't ask look, and a small pregnant pause ensued as they all smiled, just a bit. Well, let us head to the conference room, shall we? Harry quizzically ordered. They each took their respective seats in the conference room and Harry began with. Well, the first thing we have to understand is how we had this little accident in the first place. Both Dottie and I did the initial calculations and we didn't miss anything. Dobby, can we run a graphic and an optical interpretation of the jump from the beginning? Look for any anomalies that could have interfered with the control settings, ship's operations or the ship's dark matter gravity rectifiers. Just before I was rendered unconscious I thought I could see the entire ship warp or end in a rippling or liquid-like effect. Harry said in a partial questioning tone, then began nibbling on his bottom lip and rubbing his thumb and forefinger over his chin. Another thing we need to know is just, who is Eddie? There is something biting the back of my mind about this bloke, but it is as though I just can't recall anything other than that this guy is familiar in some way, or I should know who he is, or something like that, but it's like a cosmic memory charm that I just can't break through. When we have the time, sorry about the pun, we need to do a full historical search, from 1900 to 1996 under the name Eddie, Edward, Ed or any other variations to see if anything turns up in the historical databases. We will likely have to wait until we return to our own time as to make use of the late 1990s internet databases as well. In the meantime, let us go over the time jump data to find the cause of our mishap. Harry stated again, with puzzlement written across his face. Dottie spoke up then adding that he had already done an internal history search and the only thing that turned up and it seemed reluctant to display was a data file on the name Ed Lee, but the rest of the file seemed to be scrambled or damaged in some way and Dottie was not able to clean it up or glean any more information after several adjustments and filtering attempts. They began running the jump data displaying it on the transparent viewing walls a few moments into the viewing and analysis, Harry said. There, right there, what the hell was that flash? Dottie said. Ah, that would do it all right, Captain. That was a solar flare, a rather large one with a high intensity, dark matter gravity distortion right behind it and we were caught right in the middle of it. The combination of the two is what caused our artificial gravity and inertial dampeners to discharge violently throughout the inner and outer hulls, which is what you perceived as a warping or liquid-like effect on the ship itself. Honestly, Harry, it's a cosmic miracle we survived at all, much less that we were able to affect ship's repairs and return to Earth orbit. It might take another cosmic miracle to even get back to our own time. 
Do I detect a bit of cynicism there, Commander Fixit? Harry inquired with a smile, and then continued with. Well, our calculations were spot on then and we should not encounter this type of a penstance accident again as the odds are contingent with being hit by lightning several times in a row, I would think. Nevertheless, we will look for such a penstance anomalies for any future time jumps we might attempt including the next one, getting us back home. Now Harry, address Fred and George with a new proposal. I have been thinking about the Mars and Moon probes we sent out. We are no doubt going to investigate these two nearby planetary bodies at some point in the future. While Dobby and I are calculating the variables for the return to our own time I want you two to create a new matrix for the manufacturing of what I call four flight shares. These are the specs for what I want manufactured. There is no rush and I suspect this will take some time to complete so work on it when you have nothing else critical to do. Then Harry entered into a data document the specifications for his four flight shares basic design. The twins read over his shoulder as he input his specifications. The shares would be used for surface exploration of the moon and Mars or any other planetary body that the need arose for. Each chair would be a basic ship's control chair, modified to include a smaller gravity propulsion matrix similar to the ship's propulsion systems but more directed to using planetary gravity differentials. Shares are to have built-in and back-up systems for visual communications, atmosphere, pressure and magnetic shielding. Also to be included are element sensors for detecting, analysis and readout of elements on the ship's periodic tables, which have many more than Earth's current understanding of the elements and compounds as stated on its periodic table. Next, each arm of the chair is to be approximately 20 centimeters wide, with adjustable heads-up displays at the end of each arm. The left arm is to contain the sensors, analysis and display protocols, and the right arm for manual controls for all systems. Each arm is to have a handpad interface, connected to the core control computer, located in the back of the chair. Four digger weapons are to be installed in each chair. One in front on each arm and one in back on each arm, mounted on pivots for variable movements. The inside of the chair arms are to contain carry pouches for backup equipment such as teleport modules, holographic projectors, additional environment suits and utility belts, additional digger weapons etc. You get the idea. I want the chair's atmosphere, pressure and magnetic shielding to work in both parallel and in series with a suit system so that if there is a failure in one, the other will automatically take over for the failed Keep unit. Right. And then Just for turn extra right. backup protection. Each chair is to be independent but also able to be slave to the other chair so to travel longer distances, one can, as they say, drive while the others are resting. Add additional controls to the personal utility belts for remote control of each or all of the chairs. Turn right. Equip the chairs for invisibility and also the 180 degree out of face stealth mode. The chairs should be able to fly from a stationary hover than up to 500 kilometers h, up, down, left or right, backwards and naturally, forward. Finally, and I'm not sure about the need for this, but perhaps the chairs should be enclosed with a transparent wall or sphere of some kind. But the magnetic shields may be sufficient for that purpose. I only mention this because it seems like a good third back up for rider protection. The whole thing, when finished, should be about one and a half meters wide, deep and long. In other words, one by one by one meter or up to one and a half meters, if needed, something like a very small, one-seated muggle car. The built-in holographic projectors can project it to look like anything that might be needed to blend into an environment as well. When slaved together in the quad formation that is two fronts and two behind, it could even take on the appearance of a four-seated muggle car. Keep left. Anyway, you get the general idea, it is up to you to manufacture these, and refine my initial design into something workable. Dobby, you and I need to get to work on the return jump calculations. Harry stated it. Harry could hear Fred and George as they walked away saying, This is brilliant, absolutely brilliant, where do you suppose Harry came up with this flight share idea? Fred asked George as they headed for their ship's quarters to brainstorm this new idea. An hour later Harry and Dobby had completed the calculations for the jump back to the future and had decided they would risk the planned original jump to rescue Sirius. Having set all the variables and double-checked the sun and its vicinity for any anomalies that might cause a problem, they were satisfied that the jump to 1995 should come off without a hitch this time. Harry tapped his ear communicator calling Fred and George to the bridge to take their positions. 
Once everyone was in position, Harry ordered all to activate their personal protective shielding to fold and maneuver the ship into an orbit above the United Kingdom. They would start their jump from those coordinates as it was calculated that they should end up at the same place in orbit in 1995. Harry stated, Keep right. Verifying ship's chronographs read, June 18, 1917, time, 12.24 p.m. PT. Verified. Beginning countdown, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Jump. June 26, 1995, 8.04 p.m. GMT. Above the United Kingdom. Is everyone okay? Harry asked. Three knots of the head were all Harry got in response. Verify the chronometer reading, Dobby. Harry ordered. June 26, 1995, 805 p.m. GMT. Dobby happily stated. Well, that went well so far, but we don't have much time, 37 minutes to be exact. Fortunately, we had everything prepared beforehand. Harry stated as he maneuvered the ship, keeping it in a complete out of phase condition to forego the possibility of being seen as a UFO again. He brought the ship to a hover, 1,000 meters directly Keep above left. the entrance to the Ministry of Magic. Harry then input the coordinates from his pensive memories, just off to the right of the Death Vale in the Department of Mysteries. Since this was basically a one-man operation and as Harry was the only one familiar enough with this particular situation, he was elected as the teleport down person. Making sure he had all the necessary equipment, meaning a secondary holographic projector and the magnetic net displacement field projector to place over the original veil as well as a coordinate tag to place on Sirius. Harry set his own environment unit to invisibility, double check he had all his ducks lined up and hit the teleport switch sending him to his desired coordinates. He could hear the commotion in the other rooms and new time was closing in. He threw the net over the veil and activated his alternate holographic projector and then adjusted it slightly to make sure it was in the correct position 20 centimeters in front of the veil and waited for Sirius to arrive. Harry had momentarily forgotten that the fight in the veil room had been going on for a few minutes before Sirius and the others arrived. Almost caught up in the action and of watching himself a year younger Patlin with Lucius Malfoy he nearly missed Sirius' entrance. Then Sirius began defending Harry from the Malfoy creep. Harry took a look at his watch, he had managed to tag Sirius in the first few seconds of his defending young Harry from Malfoy and had to hit the switch to teleport him at just the right moment. Then Bellatrix showed up cackling with drops of drool forming in the corners of her mouth as she fired a few spells around then aimed and fired the stunner at Sirius. It was now or never Harry had to act as Sirius was beginning his backward arc. At just the right second Harry hit the switch and Sirius was teleported straight into the stasis pod in the corner of the conference room. Sirius was now out of danger. Harry had to wait a few minutes to make sure that everyone including younger Harry thought Sirius had fallen into the death veil in order to not alter the timeline. The only difference this time was that with blue glowing light from the teleport which Harry and Dottie had worked to reduce as much as possible. Harry thought he could remember and looking back through the pensive memory he could now remember there was indeed a light flash at the same moment Sirius fell into the veil. He felt all was as it should be as he watched his younger self in agony over the perceived loss of Sirius and the same agonized expression on Mooney as he held Harry from running after him. When the rest of the veil room was emptied of the people fighting and they entered the atrium of the ministry to continue their fight, Harry removed the holographic projection and teleported himself back to the ship's bridge, then ordered Dobby to take the ship back up into a standard orbit once again and collapsed into his command chair letting out a deep breath as though he had been holding it for ten minutes. After Harry, calm the he said, Mission accomplished, all went as planned, and Sirius should be in the stasis pot in the conference room. We will leave him there until we get back to our own time and consider what to do with him next. I don't want to hang around here any longer than necessary so let's get the calculations done for the next jump. Dobby said. I have them all worked out, all that is left is for you and I to go over those calculations and double check that all is correct and then make the jump. Are you sure you don't want to take a bit of time to rest before we do that Harry? Actually, I will get a bite to eat and something to drink first. In the meantime, go over the calculations again with Fred and George, then meet me in the conference room for a bite to eat as well. Another hour here won't kill us I expect. June 26, 1995, 9.07 p.m. GMT. Harry entered the conference room and walked over to the interrogation room where the stasis pod was and just looked inside to make sure Sirius was actually in there. 
Satisfied, he then went over to the food dispensing console and ordered two pork chops, a baked potato with kernel corn on the side, and a piece of chocolate cake for dessert, along with a cup of rosy hot chocolate with marshmallows melting on top. Harry relaxed for the first time in four days and took his time eating. About 20 minutes later, F. G. and D. entered and repeated what Harry had done on checking that Sirius was actually there and ordered up their dinners as well. After a short while of calmly sitting in the conference room sipping hot chocolate drinks, Harry stood up and motioned for the other to follow him back to the bridge. It was deemed that enough time had been spent making sure the calculations were correct so Harry only skimmed over them and told everyone to take their places and activate their personal magnetic shielding once again. Since Dobby was more familiar this time with the full calculations he was to pilot the ship from his bridge station for this next jump. They needed to arrive after they had originally left the first time as to not cause a time-space paradox by arriving before they left. They had considered arriving in real time, that meaning accounting for the four days spent in the past, but felt that Fred and George might have been missed and didn't want to answer the unwanted questions that would surely be asked. So they opted to arrive between one and six hours after they left. Ship's logs indicated the time they left was 1.18 p.m. June 30th GMT, so that meant arriving somewhere between 2.18 p.m. and 8.18 p.m. that evening. They were aiming for 3.18 p.m., giving a two-hour margin for error. They all felt that they had enough experience with two jumps that they could reasonably hit this mark. Ready then? Harry questioned and got three head nods in response. Very well, Dobby take us home. Dobby spoke up then saying. On one then, 5, 4, 3, 2, on one jump. June 30, 1996, 3.28 p.m. GMT. Chronometer reading Dobby? Harry asked. All is well, Captain. We have arrived just 10 minutes off the mark. The time is 3.28 p.m. June 30th, 1996 GMT, sir. Harry let out another deep breath and ordered Dobby to secure the ship again in a standard orbital configuration, stealth and out of phase, and to set the autopilot. Then had them all follow him to the information control room. Dobby sat in the control chair in front of the so-called mapping and information center and did another search at this time an internet search for the unknown Eddie Lee as this had become a nagging question to answer to all of them by this time. Several pages came up in the search that one caught Harry's eye as soon as he saw it and pointed it out to Dobby asking him to bring up the file information on that person's name, Edward Lee Scalman. Now I remember. Harry exclaimed as a picture of Eddie came up on the viewing wall. That's him all right, a bit older than when we met him, but that's Eddie all right. Now I remember having read a magazine article about this guy who had single-handedly quarried fossilized coral and sculpted it into a structure he called, what was it right, Rockgate Park, somewhere in Florida in the 1920s and 30s, then later moved the entire structure to where was it now right Homestead, Florida and renamed it, damn it, what was it called again? And both Dobby and Harry said together at the same moment, Coral Castle. That article was where I came across the term magnetic current before, as well, but could not remember where I had heard or seen that term, only that it was somehow familiar after I received my accidental information download from the ship's computer. Then Harry continued. It all makes sense now, Eddie must have found or picked up one of the handheld mass realigners in the ship crash debris and he must have gotten a jolt in info from the computer console as well, that is why he was out cold when we found him. Dobby, does the data tell us where Eddie is now if he is still alive? Dobby said. According to this biography on Eddie, he died in December 1951 of malnutrition and kidney failure at age 64. No one ever understood his theories on magnetism or magnetic current or could even read his diagrams or notes that he made over time while apparently studying the effects of the mass realigner. Apparently, no one ever saw how he managed to quarry move massive coral rocks weighing several tons with only a block and tackle a shovel and a pickaxe, apparently, all by himself. His accomplishments were quite astonishing for the circa 1920-1940, but I think we know how he managed all that, now. I think, for us anyway, we can mark this particular mystery in history under, solved. Harry then switched on the ship's log recorder. Ship's log. Earth date, June 30, 1996, 4.53 p.m. GMT. Supplemental information on Edward Eddie Leitz Stalin. 
What Eddie had apparently discovered by accident and some experimentation was that the disc-shaped object, a handheld mass right. mealiner, which Eddie apparently could right. not remember where he had found it, but assumed correctly it was while working in the Canadian forest, had the power to realign the electrons at the subatomic level, effectively creating exit. a magnetic right. field around an object in a 180-degree out-of-phase condition with an object's normal magnetic field, then vibrating that object right. until a resonant frequency was obtained thereby, removing the gravity of certain types of materials or in plain English, making a heavy object effectively Turn weightless. Right. Despite having only a fourth grade education, but it does not necessarily take a genius to understand the concept of anti-gravity and through experimentation that eventually understood the basics of how this object did its work. This was the same type of technology that made the Great Pyramids possible in the first place, built more than 10,000 years ago and made possible the building of Rock Gate Park, by one slight, even sickly looking man over a time frame of about 20 years and the subsequent moving of the entire Rock Gate Park structures to a new home in Homestead, Florida. Eddie had accomplished this, much to everyone's astonishment Keep and lack right. of understanding, completely alone with no construction company or other workers to help him. It would seem that fate itself played a part in creating this mystery as there is no other explanation as to why I could not remember this information or it could not be retrieved when Dobby made the attempt before we returned to the present time. It would seem that fate itself had meant for us to play this part in the mystery of Coral Castle. More information about this otherwise non-remarkable man can be okay, found in Earth's internet databases by looking up his name or the creation he engineered, Coral Castle, Make on any Earth-based internet terminal. Included in this log entry are three primary Earth-based internet addresses where historical data can be retrieved interested parties may search for. Coral Castle, Wikipedia for Edward Lee Skullman, Magnetic Current Blogspot, and log entry by Captain Harry J. Potter. Well, we managed to miss the Rita Skeeter spanking and the minister's public speech that was to take place at 3 o'clock p.m. Harry said with a sigh after he switched off the log recorder, then continued with, I guess we will have to wait to read that in the profit. In the meantime, Fred and George can continue their new project on the flight shares when time permits, while Dobby and I consider what to do about serious hiccup. End of episode 2, Aftermath and a Mystery in History, solved. And now episode 2, still day 2. Evening interlude, a little fun with the Dursleys. Earth date, June 30, 1996, 4.57 p.m. GMT. Everyone headed for the conference room for a little well-deserved dinner and then the twins teleported down to check on the store and check in with the family and then returned about an hour later to continue working on the flight share project. After Harry had his dinner he went to the medical bay to look through the medical database while Dobby went to his quarters to have a 30-minute anti-gravity regeneration cycle. Dobby still got a flutter of excitement and euphoria from the anti-gravity chamber. It was like smoking a bit of magic wild weed, Never otherwise mind. more commonly I'll known to muggles as pot, reefers, a doobie brother, a joint, a roach, when weed, possible. some grass, Make some skunk, some Mary J. I think I even heard it called marriage. Yeah, right. on and I know it has even been called THC. Did I miss anything? Anyway, you get the big picture. He came out of the anti-gravity chamber usually quite light-headed and tipsy and at these times was more likely to exercise his mischief side by pranking the twins when nothing else critical to ship's operations was going on at the time. Occasionally at such times, Fred and George might be found sporting the infamous hairy tail or elephant ears with daffy duck feet or even worse. Fred and George were just unable to prank the elf back as he was just too fast and usually way ahead of them. Dobby just figured it was payback for all the nuisance pranks they had played on everyone since they were infants and no one was usually able to get them back. Dobby was making it his mission in life to teach the two a lesson, that being, there is always someone better. Much like the gunfighters of the Old West, there is always someone who is faster at the quick draw and eventually you get plugged by the other guy's bullet. Meanwhile Harry was perusing the extensive medical database when he made a strange discovery. He went over the data a few more times in the procedure for this DNA modification and by now was sporting the biggest grin in Harry Potter history. Harry had just discovered a way to modify the DNA of a muggle or squid to increase the magic potential in that person. This discovery could, with some people, turn a squid into a regular magic user or turn a muggle into an emotion-driven, accidental magic user. This was in many ways just the opposite of what Harry had done to remove the magic from old snake boy Tommy. The rather large grin sported across Harry's face had everything to do with an idea for a little payback for the Dursleys. 
Why not give them a bit of the one thing they hate most in this world and with Vernon's mad temper and bulging veins this should make for a great bit of eye for an eye, Harry style revenge. Harry tapped his comm unit and ordered everyone to the conference room for a briefing. Entering the conference room with that now ever present face splitting grin, Harry took his place at the computer console and waited for the rest to turn up. Day 2, June 30, 1996, 6.23 p.m. GMT. One by one they came in and Harry could not stop himself from falling on the floor laughing as each twin was now sporting triple ZZZ dress, which stood straight out about half a meter making them a bit top-heavy with long, braided pigtails, down a meter beyond the floor and good old-fashioned, frilly, party pink, hoop skirts right out of the middle of the Old West. In addition to all of that, they had each been given one meter long duck's feet and a daffy duck mouth and seemed to be having a hell of a time just walking as each foot had to be raised really high just to take a step and try not to trip on the pigtails. Oddly though, each of them had their own face duck's mouth splitting grins as they attempted to walk in. They just stood there, in front of their computer stations as they surely could not sit down until Dobby removed his bit of Dobby style handiwork. Harry was having a lot of trouble controlling his laughing as Fred quacked out. Oi fairy quack, quack quack so tummy quack, quack. Harry went into another round of laughing so hard his sides and stomach were splitting with pain as he tried to get control over himself before he passed out from the whole ordeal while pointing a shaking finger at Dobby in an attempt to get him to undo his handiwork before Harry actually lost consciousness. By now Harry was starting to get into some serious physical trouble and was gasping for air. Dobby finally realized that Harry was losing it and removed his nasty bit of pranking on the twins and rescued Harry before any damage was actually done to his out-of-control captain. Sheepishly looking at Harry now with an I'm so sorry N.O.T. look on his little elf face as he stood Harry up and walked him back to his Go computer chair. Up. It took a few minutes to calm down in between spontaneously erupting a few times back into laughter, but eventually everyone finally settled down to business. Harry reiterated his medical find to the rest of his crew and informed them of the next mission to be executed. He began by telling them that he planned on taking the ship right over number 4 Grivet Drive in a normal, in phase condition while the ship would be pulsing and glowing, all for the effect. He actually wanted to be seen this time as a UFO hovering over the Dursleys. What could be further from normal than that? He said with a schoolgirl giggle. He then continued with his plan to teleport down in the out-of-phase condition and tag Vernon with a teleport coordinate tag, and then return to the bridge and program the computer to teleport Vernon in an anesthetized state, right onto the examination table in the medical bay. With all the T's crossed and the I apostrophe S dotted, then making sure all the proverbial ducks were lined up in a row and hoping that Murphy's Law would leave them alone for once. Harry and crew all made their way to the bridge to execute this wild plan. Entering the bridge they all took their stations and Harry took the controls, then brought the ship to the desired station keeping position just 50 meters above the Dursley's house. Day 2, June 30, 1996, 6.52 p.m. GMT. Vernon was sitting in his usual easy chair, with a reinforced string sagging as usual in an attempt to contain the hulking wheel. Dudley was home from school for the summer by now and was lying on the floor watching the tell and trying not to crash through to the basement. He was nearly as big as his father and it was a wonder to Harry that either of them could breathe or move at all with all the blubber surrounding them. The rather thin and long-necked Petunia had just entered the living room and daintily sat with a cup of good old Earl Grey tea holding it on her lap in the most British way while taking a sip with a pinky on her right hand pointing straight up. They were all in good spirits as only last evening around 8 p.m. they were informed by some thin lit stern looking woman named Penerva or Minervia or something like that from the freak's school that Harry would not likely be returning as he had taken care of the bad man and decided to go traveling or something like that. So needless to say, the Dursleys were all aflutter and quite euphoric by the good news that the freak was gone. Harry watched them for a few minutes and just shook his head at the absurdity of the whole situation and then tagged Vernon and teleported himself back to the ship. By now a couple of the nosy neighbors had noticed this pulsing and glowing thing floating in the sky right above the Dursleys and called the Bobbies to report the strange thing. Naturally, the Bobbies just exuded that condescending attitude which came across over the telephone but then the phones in the background began a ringing in unison proclaiming that the woman had been right and other reports of the same pulsing and glowing thing were starting to come in. The Bobby she had been talking to had finally informed her that they would send someone out to investigate the situation and promptly hung up. 
Harry sat back down in the command chair and programmed the computer to teleport Vernon up, but before he actually teleported him he sent the rest of his crew to the medical bay to make sure Vernon arrived in an anesthetized state as it would not do for the temper. Great Muggle to be aware of his surroundings, if for some reason Murphy paid them a visit right at that moment. Of course, by now the twins had caught on to the Murphy's Law Syndrome so they finally understood the unspoken intonation as Harry just motioned for them to leave. All set Captain could be heard from Harry's earpiece communicator a minute later. Right, enormous BMS teleporting in now! Harry said with emphasis on the statement. Enormous BMS received, creature is out cold, Captain. George stated emphatically and muttered, what is it? Harry heard that and just left tapping his earpiece saying, That thing is my Uncle Vernon, I'll be right there. Boy, Harry, you have got to be joking, I've never seen anything like this before! How does it move around, can it walk and talk at the same time? George and Fred said in unison. Having actually met the whale once before they really did recognize him but it had grown sideways a lot since then. Then Fred said. What does your auntie feed this bloke, Harry? At that moment Harry walked in the medical bay and was trying not to laugh at the twin statements. He went over to the medical computer and started a diagnosis, while projecting the diagnostic readout on one of the transparent walls. A minute later he gasped out. Great Merlin Almighty it's astonishing he is still alive, much less alive, in the first place. Look at this! Harry pointed out the cholesterol deposits in the man's arteries and the fatty compounds surrounding his heart and then the various blood clots in his uncle's legs, back and chest. With a kind of temper and blood pressure this guy, as it is nothing short of a miracle that he has not had a heart attack by now. I don't understand how he can even be alive. Harry emphatically stated. A few minutes earlier, back at the Dursley's Petunia was just about to sit on her tea again when a wish blue beam of light struck her beloved husband as Vernon disappeared. She dropped her tea right in her lap and jumped up with her hand covering her mouth in an attempt to squelch the screech at both the hot tea and the disappearing Vernon. Dudley had attempted to dry swim his way to a back corner of the room but looked more like a floundering, beached whale flapping his arms and legs about while anchored face down by his enormous torso. Together they looked the right freight. At this point a crowd was gathering outside of number 4 Privet Drive all craning their necks at the strange pulsating glow hovering just above the house. Then a few local bodies, an ambulance and two fire trucks showed up on the scene to make matters worse. Among the onlookers was Arabella Fig, who had fire, called the Ministry of Magic, not knowing if this was magic, related or not and sure enough Kinsley Shackleville, Nymphadora Tonks, Amelia Bones and Rufus Scrimgeour with an even bigger, Potter and Deuce Headache, all showed up if for no other reason than it was Potter's relatives, in the middle of whatever this was. Somehow old Rufus just instinctively knew that Potter was involved in this right up to his lightning bolt scar and beyond to the tips of his messy black hair. A knock came to the door and Petunia still, being a bit dazed, scurried over to answer the door and to her horror the street was full of onlookers staring at her and her house and a Bobby was asking her something but she didn't hear what he said in her stupefied state. Are you Mrs. Dursley? She was asked again. Why why yes. She stammered out. Is Mr. Dursley at home, ma'am? Politely asked the Bobby. Why why yes, no, I don't know, I don't think so. Mrs. Dursley managed every possible answer to that question. Mrs. Dursley, do you know anything about that glowing thing that is above your house? The body asked, still rather politely. What what glowing thing? She questioned and then took a few steps out into the yard and looked up in the sky to see the glowing thing and grumpily fainted in front of the entire neighborhood and likely half of little winging by this time. Right at that moment the pulsating glowing thing disappeared as though it just blinked out of existence. A few minutes earlier, back on the ship. It was then that everything took on a more serious tone, with Harry saying. I dare not tamper with his DNA in his condition, he is only one outburst away from a stroke or fatal heart attack. Well, there's nothing for it then, I will have to either send him back as is or and Harry stood there for a moment contemplating another option. He was struggling now really hard with his sense of morality and his bitter dislike for this muggle creature and cursing Murphy for interfering once again. 
At that point Harry turned around and walked out of the medical bay, went back to the bridge and moved the ship back to Scotland in a high stationary orbit above Hogwarts and teleported himself straight into the Chamber of Secrets and started his rather big temper tantrum throwing anything he could get his hands on and blasting holes in the ground with his own one less emotion magic, cursing and swearing at Murphy's Law for such a blatant interference in his life and moral fiber. He asked himself what his favorite Captain Kirk would do then asked himself what Harry Potter would should do. With a great sigh he had made his decision, repaired the damage he had caused and teleported back to the ship and then walked into the medical bay some 20 minutes later to see them all sitting there just waiting for him to return after blowing off some steam. I have made my decision. He stated with no amount of humor, resenting with a great sigh he continued. We can't just send him back in this condition now that we know about it. We will have to use the medical rejuvenation teleport system to clean out his arteries, then we can make the necessary change to the DNA structure to give him a bit of emotion magic. However, it means that he will likely live another 40 years. Then we also have to consider what to do about Dudley as well, as it is most likely he is in as bad a shape as his father. Then Harry continued while pointing at all three of them. I want to know which one of you morons came up with this insane idea for a little petty revenge in the first place and don't give me that pass the buck finger pointing at each other either or I really will build a brigadier and put a lot of you in there for a month. Actually come to think of it, the stasis chambers would make a good brigadier for a lot of you when you get on my nerves with your moronic ideas. Harry emphatically stated trying to hold back a smile while seeming incensed by the three of them. They all sat there, in stunned silence, for a minute at the audacity of their captain's accusing rent and then all three of them together, pointed their waving fingers at him and said in perfect unison. You are the moron that came up with this insane idea for a little petty revenge captain sir. Ah well right, then one of you other morons should have put a stop to it before it got this far. Don't let it happen again. And when we finish this little misadventure, I'll be spending a month in the brigadier then. Harry smiled his humorous, got your smile on the mood, and again shifted back to the previous state. Right, well let's get him ready for the medical rejuvenation teleport system then. Doggy said. The procedure went without any more interference from that bastard. Murphy and Vernon was, for all intents and purposes, a new man. He would likely Keep never right, know that Harry had given the bastard right. a second chance at life with a twist of emotion magic to just make his days perfect with minor freaky things happening all around him within being the cause of the freakishness turn he so adamantly right. hates. Oh, you will figure it out eventually that he is actually the cause but by then you will have a label tacked to him with the invisible word F-R-E-A-K stamped on his forehead and the whispers of co-workers and so-called friends of his unnaturalness spreading for the next 40 or so years. All in all Harry was pleased with the outcome. The procedure only took a few minutes as the medical rejuvenation teleport system was relatively instant in the act of dematerializing Vernon and then rematerializing him minus the entire in his bio systems. What the planet wouldn't do to get their hands on this technology. Harry put the ship back in station keeping above number four again but this time opted to keep it in the out of phase condition as they had already made quite the scene in front of the Dursleys and Harry figured that was enough to keep the neighbors pointing and talking for decades to come. Plus the local muggle media had turned up as well and caught most of the happenings including that same glowing thing that had been caught on video yesterday afternoon. Harry realized he could not risk the ship being seen like that again or it would certainly be connected to Harry and that could not happen. As it was, old Rufus was a crafty old bastard and already was putting some pieces together. That is why Harry decided he and Fred would tell him down as Hank and Frank then try to dispel any suspicion that Harry was involved. After having deposited Vernon back in his reinforced easy chair, Hank and Frank appeared in the alley behind the houses and walked around in front and right up to Chinsley, asking him what was going on. Chinsley introduced Frank and Hank to Rufus and the others and the SOS agents showed their impressive muggle magic identification to the Minister of Magic and the head of the DMLE. Old Rufus raised an eyebrow and asked Chinsley if these were the same agents that took out the Death Eaters in Diagon Alley yesterday and the affirmative nod set Rufus to ask why they had never heard of this SOS before. Get ready Harry just responded left. with a single word. Turn left. Classified. Then Harry went into control mode and demanded a report from the minister as to what was going on at the Dursleys. Rufus bristled a bit but took another look at the ID cards and decided not to challenge them as the card stated emphatically to defer his command to the card holder and yesterday Rufus tried to find some information on this SOS but got a rather scary response for his efforts. 
This SOS was some very, very, very high level of classification and Rufus and his nuts squeezed in a vice when he pushed for more information. The only thing he was sure of was that this SOS was connected to some very, very high level authority and was in charge whenever they showed up on the scene. Word on this SOS was actually spreading quite fast, at least in the magic world. Fred Frank was really quite in awe at how Harry just took control of everything as though he was born to it. Rufus began his report. Well, these people are the relatives of Harry Potter. You do know about Potter, right? Rufus questioned. Hank nodded and said. Yes, in fact, we are looking for him as we want to question him about how he managed to split your Dark Lord riddle. We have a stake out here hoping he will show up as he just seems to have disappeared after he took care of your riddle problem. Continue. Hank demanded. Well, we got a call from a resident here about some strange magic above the Dursley's house, so we came out to investigate. I normally would leave this sort of thing up to field personnel, but where Potter is concerned, especially after his little ultimatum yesterday, I wanted to see things first, and... Oh, well, that glowing magic, as you call it, has nothing to do with Potter himself, but it does concern us for other classified reasons. I think the Dursley's involvement is nothing more than a coincidence. Hank stated authoritatively then continued. The Muggles will just chalk all this up to another UFO sighting so there is no need to obliviate the Muggles. I suggest you just head on back to the Ministry now. We will be in touch if such situations call for it, in the meantime Terry Young Minister. Hank stated. Then Hank and Frank walked down the street and rounded a corner and went out of sight, teleview back to the ship. Next they tagged the DUD, then telebeamed him up and the procedure went as planned with Dudley having the same medical Get rejuvenation ready. but Turn Harry left. was not going to give this other bastard any such magic, in fact just the opposite Turn he made left. sure that Dudley had any magic potential locked and bound permanently as the crit was already too much of a holy. If he had emotion magic he would find some way of using it to hurt others where his father would just turn into himself not wanting to be perceived as anything other than the most normal. In fact, once Vernon figures it out, he will take steps to better control his temper and might, just might turn out to be a decent man one day in the future. Well, we can all fantasize that it could happen one day anyway, right? They stayed for a little while right above the house and watched through the rich transparent walls as the Dursleys tried to figure out what had happened and sure enough they blamed all this freakishness on Harry. As Vernon lost his temper at that thought, every window in the house actually cracked and the coffee table just broke in half right in front of all three of them. Vernon jumped up with an alacrity he had not experienced since his youth and realized that he actually felt good. He could breathe much easier and the red face was actually due to oxygenated blood actually flowing through his veins and arteries once again. The dead had much the same reaction and Petunia just looked like she had swallowed a few lemons at the entire ordeal. Oh, the neighbors would talk all right. In fact, the Dursleys would be the talk of little winning for some time to come. Day 2, June 30, 1996, 8.47 p.m. GMT. All in all, Harry thought it had been one hell of a day. June 30, 1996 was a day to remember that was for certain. Later that evening before Harry retired for the night, he made a final log entry for the day. Captain Harry J. Potter SOS Potter Personal Log Entry, June 30, 1996, 1021 p.m. GMT. If I ever get my hands on this Murphy character, I will twist his head clean off, hiccup. And so ends episode 2, day 2, parts 1 and 2. Please review, rate, or comment. And so ends my first two episodes of the SOS Potter. I hope you enjoyed this rather ODD fanfiction story.